Yes, yes, it is DJ Ski from Dash Radio, and you are now listening to the number one South Asian radio station in the world. I'm talking about Ruckus Avenue Radio, Dash Radio's exclusive South Asian station. Let's go. Hi everyone, welcome to The Brighter Side of News. I'm Rizwan Manji and I'll be your host today. With me is Ismail Bashi, who you may know uh, from a previous podcast I had. Uh, Joseph Shavit, who runs a website called The Brighter Side of News. Sanjay Chandani and Tony Von Hala. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy this hour um, and uh, we should have some fun together. Welcome to the brighter side of news. Thanks, guys. Uh, I have with me Ismail Bashi again. Hey, Ismail. Hey, what's up? I like your stress on again. I know your voice upsets me sometimes, but it upsets everybody I know. Yes. This is the brighter side of news, so I'm going to have a cheery face on. And be bright. And speaking of the brighter side of news, uh, we have Joseph Shavit, who actually runs a website uh, called The Brighter Side of News, which is how we came up with the name of this podcast. And he's going to be on right now, and he's going to share something that is a part of the newsletter. So, hey, Joseph. Hey, guys. Uh, glad to be here. Um, yeah, you know, you know, our newsletter covers an awful lot of stories um, each week. And, you know, recently we've seen a spate of amazing stories of celebrities and just well-known individuals. Some of them I may not call celebrities that are giving away large sums of money. And I, you know, ordinarily, I wouldn't necessarily talk too much about it from the standpoint of it happens occur you know, recurringly throughout the year. Um, we recently ran a story that says that this year, this COVID year, um, actually more money has been given out by celebrity philanthropy than ever in history. Um, well over $7 billion have been given out. And so as a whole and as a rule, it's just absolutely fabulous news. You know, the wealthy giving back in, in meaningful ways and so before I get too deep into the specifics of the individual story, I really love to get some feedback from you guys about, you know, your views on celebrity giving, how, you know, maybe highlight some of the great things that you guys have done um, and uh, go ahead, Ish. Well, I have a question because the only celebrity I know is Rizwan. I want to know how much has he given in this <laughs> yeah, year? Yeah. I, because I, I certainly I, haven't I received gonna, anything from him. I knew there was going to be some uh, insulting comment. Coming. It's not insulting. It's a serious query. I am very well, concerned. I have to say that I uh, not only donate my time and money to an organization that I find very important to me, which I know Ismail has also uh, helped out with the Aga Khan Foundation, which does uh, these walks. Uh, and, you know, they kind of stopped for... Uh, during the COVID year, but I'm hoping that they'll be back. But I, that's what I do. I spend a lot of uh, my time and uh, uh, my service towards the Aga Khan Foundation, which is Ismail knows. And what about you, Ismail? I have been uh, donating my time, which I have a lot of since I don't work as much <laughs> as you do. <laughs> I, but I, I know do. that Ismail donates a lot of his time to the school. Uh, yes. Possible. Yes. And it's actually, it's, it's, it's a joyous thing to do because, you know, it's the, we have a great school community where my kids and Rizwan's kids go to school too. But anyway, uh, you, you also, in all seriousness, you wanted our opinion as to what we think about, about celebrities giving. I think anybody giving is a great thing, you know? Good, good. Yeah. I, one of, one of the pieces of feedback that we'd received and, you know, we're always, sub, you know, we always take a lot of time in thinking about, what the core message is to a story that gets put out. And, you know, we tend to put out a number of these stories because we think that the overall, just like you just said, the overall message of this being somebody giving of themselves back to the community in some way um, is a, a good, and, a, and it, you can attach any kind of weight to it in any other different way, but overall, archingly, it is a really good thing. Um, but, you know, we continue to get feedback and we listen to our readers and, you know, some of the elements of feedback have been, 
and, and I'll give a specific kind of name just to frame it for our listeners here. You know, you've got some amazing giving out of people like um, Jeff Bezos and Mackenzie Scott, his ex-wife. Um, and some of the negative feedback has been not necessarily from them uh, about those two individuals, but as a macro of celebrity, um, a, should they be giving more and paying more in taxes than they are giving? So i.e. that money comes into the government and then gets spread out uh, based on the needs of everyone. So we don't end up with huge deficits. So that's one frame of reference that people have given um, and feedback that people have given back. And then the other piece, which I actually thought was even more relevant than that, although I, I absolutely understand that first perspective, which was the choices that they're making in terms of where they're giving the money. So, you know, most recently, this last week, Mackenzie Scott, not putting her on a, on a spotlight, did an amazing thing of giving away $2.7 billion, a sum of money that 99.9999% of the people in the U.S. can't even fathom, let alone ever hope to achieve. Um, but the feedback's been, she was giving it to universities or she gave a substantial amount to universities around the country. And, you know, the negative side to that was, well, here in a world where tuitions are going up because university and huge endowments in these universities are making these universities billion dollar for profit enterprises. And you've got students going bankrupt uh, because they can't afford to pay their student loans. And, you know, going to just a regional college costing you $40,000 a year when, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, it may have cost you $10,000 a year, just leaves a little negative taste in people's mouths. So I, I, I felt this was a good program for us to kind of talk about that, see if yeah. we agree with those. I, you know, who am I to tell people who have billions of dollars, which I don't, to where to give their money to? But um, what it does, what your comment does remind me of is a podcast. Uh, and again, why am I recommending another podcast on this podcast? Who knows? But I uh, love this podcast. It's uh, Revisionist History. And uh, it's Malcolm, Ga Malcolm Gladwell's podcast. And he talks about this specific issue, which is money being given to, to uh, universities and how they have so much money that they'll never be able to even use in their entire existence. They have so much money and people still continue to give them money. And there might be other ways to sort of help the students, which is what it looks like that they're doing. Like it looks like the celebrities are helping students, which actually they're not. It's not like the students get any sort of uh um discount on their on their on their tuition so it is an interesting thing to 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 talk about and you know that podcast really opened my eyes to it so i see where the backlash is coming and and uh yeah maybe there is a better way to spend your money the question is it's like if we start nitpicking where everybody's sending their money, do you think people will stop giving money? And that also becomes a problem, right? Like we don't want that to stop. We want, we want the charitable giving to, to happen. So I don't know, Ismail, your thoughts? Well, I guess the question is as far as if there is no benefit from uh, like, for example, in this last endowment to these universities, is any part of that endowment set aside for scholarships for, you know, uh, different parts of, you know, um, the, the educational uh, students at all, or is it just to the university? That, that's a very fair question. Um, the, the stories themselves don't define where specifically the dollars within these universities are going. I, I personally would absolutely believe that a large portion of it would be going to some form of student endowment to, you know, help for more, more scholarships, probably, you know, on the other hand, I've heard, you know, it like costs I, a lot to name a building. So it's possible that some of it goes towards creating facilities. Sure. But again, have a, a, a spinoff benefit, obviously to the students that are there, but you know, again, doesn't necessarily address core issues of, you know, can students afford to get the education that they need or are the, or is this money being spent in a way that isn't really trickling down as effectively as it could towards students? Well, you know, the bo 
we have to understand, I think, in my opinion, that no matter what you do in life with whatever good intention, there will always be somebody who has a problem with it. Okay. And as far as I completely understand uh, your point, as far as, you know, like questioning whether the money can be used in a better way or not. But again, um, who, like this one said, it's not up to us if someone is donating money. And I know we're just giving our opinion on that. I think they should be allowed to give money to whoever they want. But because I think most people, including myself and Rizwan and maybe you, Absolutely. most people give to charities that they're directly have some kind of a connection to. Yeah. You know, they have some sort of connection. It could be a socioeconomic, familial, religious connection to a political affiliation to. And we all do it because in some ways there's also some kind of reciprocity. Uh, if not even um, uh, a fiscal reciprocity, maybe it's, uh, you know, you just feel good about doing it for that section of the community or society that you feel uh, strongly about. So I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, we also have to, as far as say, for to give that specific example of Mackenzie Scott, um, it's not that she's only, maybe this last big $2.8 billion, was it, that right. she gave to you, but she has given even, a few months ago, and that was not to university. She, so she, she gives across the board. So it's not like she's only focused on donating just to universities and just to these rich institutions, you know, to, you know, to put like, you know, I mean, Rizwan and I also want our names on the Rizwan and Ismail Foundation for the Performing Arts. I, right, I like my name, but I don't want it. I don't want your name attached to it. Like I put my name second. So at least it'll, like, you, I don't know, need it'll feed your ego. <laughs> you can have your own building, but I'd like my <laughs> Okay, mine will be adjacent. <laughs> there, you, yeah. your, yours will be your, yours will be the small building yeah. to the yeah. left of it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, and, and and that's and that's fair. And I love I love hearing this kind of stuff. And again, you know, I the last thing I would ever want you know anyone listening to this podcast to think is that this is anything other than using her as an example. Um, from a, you know, a person and a story perspective that this is actually anything just directly against Mackenzie or, or Bezos. No, this, no. this, this happens across the board to, you know, and there's hundreds of celebrities that have donated an awful lot during the course of this year. And the conversation I think that you guys bring to bear is, is a couple of very valid points. One being, and again, the reason why we put it on the brighter side of news all of this discussion is providing oxygen and, and some, some life to conversation that people have on the boards and through, and through emails back saying, this is what we think about this story and whether it's actually as good as you guys think it is. It is, it is interesting to me. And I, I, it's a question that I'm now asking is why do so many celebrities donate to universities? Like, what is the motivation? You know, like maybe it's like they're alumni. I get it. But why specifically to universities when there is possibly there could be an argument that there's a better way to do this, right? right. A better way and more more good can be done. So uh, I'd be interested to finding out why that is the case for maybe the future, maybe a future conversation. And we there, can get on it. There, uh, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think there might be a certain angle that the tax write-offs are better when you give it to an educational institution. Maybe. I, they're, Maybe. They're, they're, well, which again brings to your first point is that why do people, you know, why do these billionaires and celebrities give in the first place? A lot of it is also because it's, it, you know, it's, it's a tax write-off. Yeah. It is. And I've, I've also heard, you know, other celebrities actually say this on other, other talk formats, whether it's been on the news or, or on podcasts, that the last thing that they would really want to do is pay that money in the form of tax and have the government decide where that money goes. They've worked hard for that money. They want to give it away. They want to have control over who gets it and where it goes. Um, and again, the glass is always half full and half empty. Absolutely. If I'm them, I agree with it. I can. Uh, and I think they would even agree that they could see the other side of that statement from, you know, the rest of the world saying, yeah, but, you know, again, you're giving it away to Harvard University, whereas there are huge communities in the United States that don't have jobs because industry isn't building in their neighborhoods to provide jobs. And, how many jobs in this economy could to you know could 
10 billion dollars create if it was spent in that way rather than spent in other ways to either educate and even and even specifically other universities right. like there's other universities that are not harvard university like harvard university doesn't need the money but there are universities that actually do need the money you know and so there's there's also the question of like why do you keep giving money to like the uh, rich establish uh, Ivy League schools. Right. So I don't have, I, I, I don't have, I mean, I, I'm okay with that point, but as far as that uh, creating jobs uh, and trust me, I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, any specific billionaire, but don't you think that Amazon creates a lot of jobs? Absolutely. So they are already doing their bit by creating jobs. Absolutely. But right? so yeah. as far as where they can donate, whether Jeff Bezos or Mackenzie Scott, that's I think that's their personal choice. I think anybody donating is good time or money. So I understand the naysayers, but I think it's at the end of the day, it's your money. It's your choice. It's on your conscience where that money goes. And as long as they know that the world is watching, that's OK. But I don't think we can sort of we should be. um I don't know. I mean, emotionally guilting people into um, sort of, you know, doing things a certain way because it's, they're, do, they're doing what, what is right within their rights and means. And, and that's absolutely fair. And I think the listeners um, will absolutely have an opinion on this conversation. I, I have no doubt about that. And the, you know, those that respond out through the, through the newsletter and, and through our website, um, will absolutely give um, their feedback and have been giving their feedback. So you're right. I, I, I'm speaking for, for that, you know, quiet mass that's out there of people who, who, who are passing us the information so that we can, in this conversation, have this discussion. But I would say that from their perspective, it's not really about telling them how they should spend their money as much as it is enlightening them to the fact that that money in today's society can have the power to move mountains and where you put it is always going to be scrutinized because quite frankly, there are people in rural underserved, even in urban centers that are struggling day to day to pay their bills um, and to find work. And this money can bubble up from the bottom through them and do an awful lot of good. Not in any way saying that putting that money into, you know, certain universities that need the money and or into university programs that are working on cutting edge technologies that might end up revolutionizing the world or the environment is a bad thing in any way. I don't think anybody who's emailed us would have would say that that is the case. It's just a question of prioritization and what is and how can that money do the most good um, the most immediately. And so that's the feedback we got. I, I love that we shared it. I appreciate you, you know us having this great discussion about it here. I'm sure our listeners are going to have um, a hell of a an opinion of their own. And um, we look forward to hearing it and finding out what people think. Thanks uh, so much, Joseph. Uh, if you get a chance, check out the website, the brighter side of news. Uh, and you can also sign up for uh, the newsletter. Ruckus Avenue Radio. All right, let's get started. Uh, Ismail Bashi, are you here? I am here, and I'm very happy to be here. So Ismail was uh, talking to me about virtue signaling. I actually am not really sure what virtue signaling is. So I have asked Ismail to explain what virtue signaling is. And then like we always do, we will argue about it because that's what me and Ismail do on a regular basis. So Ismail, can you explain to everybody what virtue signaling is? Absolutely. Well, first off, um, happy to be here. And would you like the definition as in the Webster's uh, dictionary or do you want my version? 
That's I'd the like question. the Ismail Bashi version of what. Okay, means. so the Ismail Bashi version of virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is something, it's a phenomenon that I've noticed recently, but let me just define what it actually means. It means that you try and show, you know, you publicly express something, an opinion or a sentiment, uh, which tries to show your good character, but you do it uh, most likely on social media. You do it, uh, you know, on Instagram or, or Facebook. And for example, um, you know, you do something good. You do something that is uh, sort of noteworthy or maybe something that's charitable or something that, you know, is nice or spreads joy. Why can't you just do that and move on and let it be what it is for you know, intrinsically what it's meant to be a good deed. Why does a good deed when a good deed is advertised, it's the purest form of virtue signaling. And I know okay, somebody on, might think that I'm being a Grinch here, but that's just my opinion. Hold Go on one second. I have a, I have a question for you. Sure. You, just so we're clear. So everyone who's listening is clear. You think if you do something nice, it mm -hmm. defeats the purpose by putting it on social media. Is that what you're saying? Um, Part of it. Yes. Part of it. I mean, there could be something that it could be done nice, which actually requires uh, social interaction. And that's a different thing altogether. Say something that is a community effort and you're trying to maybe, I don't know, uh, uh, try and organize money and fundraise for a, a, a worthy cause. Now, that's not really, uh, you know, virtue signaling. But I mean, I'm going to give you a simple example. And I think it has a lot to do with, um, for example, when you... Um, uh, Let's take, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But the most basic example, not even doing a good deed, it's almost like falling uh, prey to the social uh, pressure. Uh, you, go to, you go to dinner with your, uh, say, family and friends, and you, somebody will, you know, you want to mention it on social media because obviously you can go to dinner or you can do anything fun without actually mentioning it on Facebook. So you go and you mention, oh, went to dinner today. It was so much fun to be out after 11 months. But of course, we socially distant with our masks on and you take a picture with your mask on. Is that necessary? Okay, so that's not really doing a good it's, deed. It's, 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 it's a... Okay, well, go on. Okay, this, this, this probably me, this makes me feel like people are afraid of being canceled, right? Like they wanted to go out, which I get because I want to go out as well. And then we go out and we just want to make sure that us posting about going out doesn't get us canceled because there's the people who are going to cancel you if you are out in public, right? So I think that's, is that what you're saying? Like people just want to make sure that they're not going to get ostracized for going out and eating in public. That is part of it. Uh, and I think the cancel culture and this whole uh, uh, attitude we have towards things that we tend to judge things is also a part of it. It's an offshoot of it, but I do get the fact that nobody likes to be canceled. And I think that need also to impress people and show one's moral character to, so, so it's, it's a two part thing. One is to show like, look, I'm doing so much good and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, do I'm donating to charity. I'm doing yeah. this, but I have to show it that I, uh, on social media, Oh, I walked in the street and I found this dollar bill, but I picked it up and I gave it to, uh, you know, the right, I look for the right yeah. one. I'm, I'm giving you, you know, very vague examples, but, or you help somebody, does that need to be advertised? The other thing is that to show your moral superiority, showing that you are so law abiding and so, uh, you know, fantastically a good human being by doing that, you're doing all the right things. So I think part of it is motivated by the fear of being canceled or by the fear of being judged harshly by your peers, because you actually, so I guess my question is what has happened to personal choice? Well, personal here's freedom. Other, here's my, here's my, to your first point. Yes my sort of rebuttal to that is, look, we spend a lot of our time on social media. We just do. We share a lot about, and we can argue about the merits of social media, but th that really is what we do now. We share about our families. We share about our work. We share about a, a bunch of stuff. And I would argue that if sharing something that you did, like that, that, that a good deed that you did makes you do more good deeds because it makes you feel better because the likes make you feel better, then what's bad about that? Because if, it, if people are in the, if the result is more people doing 
nice things for people or positive things or raising money or any of this stuff that you mentioned, if, if that's, if that's the outcome of it, because they're getting likes, then what's wrong with that? You know, we look at the end of the day, nothing is, is without, uh, some self-serving. We don't just do acts of, we do, we don't just do acts of kindness out of nothing. It makes us feel good, right? We, we do something nice for a person and it makes us feel good, but it also makes us feel good to share that with someone. What's really wrong with that? Okay. Well, that's a good point that you've made. Uh, there's nothing wrong if actual good comes out of it. And you're absolutely yeah. right. If it makes people do more good things. And, and look, first of all, let me just preface this by saying that this is just my opinion. I'm not saying how people should live their lives. And you know what? They can do whatever they want and to each his own. But if something good comes out of it, sure. However, I was raised in a culture where you were told that if you do something good, you do it for the sake of doing good, not because for the sake of the recognition of it, not because it makes you feel good only when somebody recognizes your good deed. You should yeah. feel good purely by doing that act. That, that act is- itself should be a source of joy. The fact that you do it and because you know it's the right thing to do is what should be your motivating factor. Not how many likes you get, not because someone is going to say or pat your back and say, oh my God, that was, you know, I gave you an uh, example to somebody the other day is like, maybe not virtue signaling, but say when you go and uh, I've noticed that and, and believe it or not, I've done that myself. You go to say Starbucks and you, uh, you buy a coffee. And if you want to give a tip, if the cashier is looking away, you kind of wait till the person is looking at you, put that tip in the tip jar. Yeah. Why? Why do people do that? I, and like I said, I, I'm guilty of that myself. Do I need that cashier to know? Like if I give that person a tip and he doesn't oh, do. or she doesn't oh, see I me. Do. Because I'm yeah. going to come. I, I'm going to come back to that restaurant or that, that, and I don't want to be the Spit guy in your coffee. <laughs> I don't want to be ostracized for not giving a tip. So well, yeah, I do want them to know that's a, that's almost like survival. That's like a survival instinct. I want to make sure that this server knows that I am, uh, that, 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 that I'm tipping. So then it's I, not about a good deed. It's, 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 it's a different motivation. Can it, then. Both? can it not be both? I don't know. It could, it could. It could be both. It could be both. I agree. I have, but- I have a bigger issue with the uh, look. If, if it in fact is a good deed, if in fact it does help someone that I'm all for it, look, get the praise, put it on social media, get the likes, whatever, whatever you need to do to make sure that that good stuff is happening. I have another issue with it strictly being performative. Do you know when it's just about the performance? Well, of that's it, my that point. Be, that, well, well, that's two different things because there's there's performative stuff that doesn't actually turn into to 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 good. It's just there. It, it's almost like you but, know, when, you, when you when you share stuff that you are not willing to to do yourself, right? That's to me performative. But I and, think okay, I'll let uh, okay. So a little. Uh, I'm going to add to that. I think a lot of it is performative. A lot of it is very disingenuous. A lot of it is done not because you really wanted to do it is because you wanted to post something on social media. It's because that you wanted people to think that you are this amazing person. It's like everything we do on social media. Like, you know, you go there and you have to show that, Oh, you ate this thing or you, you know, personally. And and I, and again, it's what I uh, choose to do. I, most of my posts are about my work because that's how the business works. But You know, people can boast about anything. I'm just saying that the whole virtue signaling concept is just, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way. And I know it can be done with the right intention. I have a scenario from my own life that just happened. Oh, this is going to be good. uh, uh, March 21st was Navroz, which... uh, Navroz Mubarak. Navroz Mubarak. I'm a smiley. So we celebrate Navroz. And on Navroz, I was in Vancouver with my mom and my mom made food, mom and her sister and their friends. They ordered food and like got all this stuff. They packed up stuff for the seniors that were in nursing homes in Vancouver because they don't see anyone. And it was a special day. Uh, I helped them pack it up. I helped them wrap it and we delivered it to a bunch of people. 
And, you know, I felt, I, I felt really good about, about doing that. I mean, I did very little work, but my mom, you know, I felt really happy about my, my mom and my aunt and all these people. And then I took photos and I posted it on social media and I said, oh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing. It made me feel good. It made me feel good to share. It made me feel good that people knew what I was doing, what my mom was doing, what my aunt was doing, what her friends were doing. Would you say that that in itself is, is wrong in your opinion? Uh, no, it's not wrong. It's not wrong at all. It's not wrong. I would say on my scale of virtue signaling, I would give it like a one. <laughs> now we have okay. A so yeah, there are grades of virtue signaling. It's not just black and white. You know, it's different shades of gray. So I'd give it a one, but that was a genuine act. So it wasn't something that you did only because you thought it was going to get you likes. It was a genuine thing. You do it for your community. I know how involved you are with the Ismaili community and otherwise. So it's fine. In fact, it does help people. Maybe it motivates them to do more for charity, for, you know, being part of the community. You know, somehow you, everybody look inherently, I know that. And I want to believe that as human beings, we all want to do good. Yeah. And I totally support that, you know, do good because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel good about the world. Uh, it makes us feel good about ourselves. It's just the act of this need for recognition, this disingenuous act of showing not just the doing good, but also showing how moral your character is. Like, you know, when people try and uh, give instances of something that they did, which was, which was kind of like, uh, you know, it made them question their choices and this and that. And it's like, are you saying that because you're trying to show us that, you know, you have this deeper conviction that you want to feel good about yourself because now you're feeling guilty. But anyway, that could just be me. And also maybe I'm a virtue signaler in, in, in hiding. I think there's another aspect of it, which we might not have touched on, but it's the policing of it. Right. Absolutely. Like we have social people on, we have a lot of people, we have mutual friends on, on Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter where, uh, you're afraid because they're policing you, right? Like absolutely they'll say something, well, why didn't you do it this way? Or why didn't you do this? Or if it was me, I would have done, I would have done this. It's, it happens a lot in our, in our school group as well. I don't know if you've noticed, but mm -hmm. they, somebody will post something and everybody will be like, well, I don't think that, you know, kids should have to do this. And again, everybody has a different point of view, but that almost policing of your parenting style about, you know, and during the pandemic, it became Everything. very, very apparent because people had different, uh, different ways of coping, right? Like people had different ways of coping through this pandemic and sometimes they would share it and then there would be the, you know, the, the, the ramifications uh, of that, thing of it, which because, was, which was but yeah. Also uh, frustrating. So I do see that. I, I see. I see your point there because it also makes me frustrated. It also makes me less wanting to share. I always have to like think about. Oh, am I gonna get? Am I gonna get yelled at on social media by blah blah blah? Who just yelled at this person for for you know whatever? So that makes me. Um, I, I do hear you. That makes me nervous. I also, you know, uh, I wanted to point out something else, which is in, which is in a in a different line of what you were saying. But I was watching Undercover Boss. I don't know if you've seen Undercover Boss. I have. I've been in quarantine for way too long, so I've been watching Undercover Boss. And it to me, it's a it, that's another form. Is that it's very you you see it's very performative. And at the end, the CEO gives out money and bonuses to all these people. And you're and I always think to myself, well they're just doing this because they're on undercover boss, right? Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't, why didn't, why didn't this person, the CEO decide to give this person who was clearly hurting or these things before, but it's the performance of being on the show. And then I said, well, you know what? If it took the show to help these people, well, then why is it bad? Like, okay, fine. Yes, maybe they should have done it before, but if it's the show that was the impetus, so maybe it is a good thing. Do you see when it's like, um, uh, the balance there of the difference between the two things. I, I do. I do. And I agree. And you know what, on that happy note, I think we can uh, both sort of um, agree that we came to some kind of a compromise on this subject. We so, never do. We never do, but that's, well, I, we kind of <laughs> did. Let's just don't ruin this moment for me. Okay. <laughs> we kind of did. All right. So let's just take it for what it is. Um, and I think, you know what, this is a good start. It's, it's a good place to have a discussion and we might talk about it more in the future when we see some more virtue signaling. Ruckus Avenue Radio.
Hi, everyone. Thank you for continuing to listening to us and uh, not canceling us. I have Tony Von Halle here, and Tony is going to share uh, a story with us and also talk about a new segment that we might continue to use. Uh, hey, Tony. Hey, Riz. How are you? Uh, can you share with us? Uh, it's ethically ambiguous. Is that yes. what we're talking yes, about? Yes, it's a play on words right. from ethnically ambiguous. As an actor, you know I'm an actor, right? Uh, as an actor, I have tried to live uh, in that world, that bubble where I'm ethnically ambiguous, where I can fill many different uh, ethnicities, if you will. Uh, that's something that was really popular with casting probably about 10 years ago, uh, a little less so now. But You mean uh, like white people taking our roles? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Because I wasn't getting roles. So I said, well, if I can't get cast as a white dude, a white Take it from Jewish the brown dude. guy. Right, right, right. Let's see. Well, if I, can... I, with my mustache, I can't be ethnically ambiguous. Literally, I'm a sore thumb. <laughs> I just am Indian in flashlights. And you know what? That's a really great point. And I think I will start uh, trying to score a, a mustache to see if I can get something going. Because <laughs> uh, the fact is, you know, I mean, it's been a good few months, but before that, it was bone dry. So I've been trying to live in this world of, uh, you know, filling in that ethnically ambiguous spot. And, uh, and I, it, it hit me that I've kind of lived my life being ethically ambiguous. I have, uh, through most of my life, I've gotten by with, with privilege, my white privilege that I've uh, kind of addressed in the last, I don't know, four or five years. Uh, I've used privilege to my advantage to get by at different times. And they were moments that weren't necessarily for my survival, but perhaps they, they got me in places. Um, and so I was thinking about it as we were talking about our kids and, and I don't know, it was a funny story that came out recently. And I thought, you know, I, uh, I have, I've definitely used my kids uh, in moments to get in places. And uh, I think about the fact that I've got two kids. I've got two kids, a five-year-old and a nine-year-old. And both of them at the age of two, my wife and I developed a plan. We would start at two and a half. We would buy season tickets for uh, season passes for Disneyland because we don't live too far away. And we would just buy for the two of us uh, when our first kid was around and uh, he would get in for free because he was under three. And we figured, well, if we do it at two and a half, we're good. He's in for free. And then by age three, we could probably pass him for two for another six months. He was a small dude. And uh, he's a talkative dude at that point. And what started to happen was uh, we were feeling guilty that, oh, you know, what happens? What happens if we go through the line and they look at our kid and say, well, how old is he? And we figured, well, we can say he's two, but what if they asked him? And so I had to coach my three-year-old at this point. He's three and we're still using these season passes just for the two of us. And so I said to him, if they ask you how old you are, I don't want to ask you to lie. Just say pee, pee, poo, poo. And he just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And uh, for the rest of the day, he was saying pee, pee, and poo, poo. Um, they never asked him. We got in, we went, I don't know, 12 times in 12 months. So I guess six times after he had turned three, they never asked him how old he was because, you know, he was cute. And, uh, and I used that privilege of saying he's cute. And um, so... The second kid came around and he's much bigger. He came out, I think, a pound and a half bigger at birth than the first kid. And we're like, well, let's do this again. My wife was itching to go to Disneyland. And uh, so, yeah, we did it. We bought the tickets, the three of us. We saved up, got our three season passes. And he, we, he was good for the first six months. And he turns three. And again, pee pee poo poo. He's not as much as a, of a talker at that point, but uh, he went along with it. So I feel like I feel justified that I didn't ask my kids to lie, but it's been sort of haunting me. But is as, that how you got away? Is that how you got away with uh, like, do you feel guilty about it? Like if you had said, no, say you're two, would that have made a difference? Yeah. I mean, having to I, I can justify that I, I wasn't lying because, uh, you know, I didn't ask my three-year-old to say he was two. I just said, but just did say you not lie? Two. I mean, by not buying the tick by buying the tickets, not buying the tickets for a three-year-old. 
100%. And so that is, as I'm trying to uh, turn my life around, if you will, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating the, um, the, the eth ethical ambiguousness of this. Like, was this, you know, was I lying? I, yes, I, I was lying. Am I okay with it? Uh, it's questionable. You know, at times when I'm feeling pretty decent about myself, I have to cut myself down just, you know, for self-sabotage purposes. Well, first First, before we get to the to the whether or not we can do this or it's bad or it's good, you know, there's I would I it's, we have Ismail here as well. Ismail, have you done anything similar to this? Beep beep poo poo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you have, so you better start sharing, or I'll share for you. I do it all the time, and I have there's no ambiguity about it with for me. I know when I'm doing something wrong. So, so it's, ethically, it's, you it's, just... it's, it's black and white. I still do it. I'm not saying that I commit some high crimes and misdemeanors, but there's a lot of questionable decisions I take every day and I'm pretty sure they're wrong. And I like, like most people, I use them to my advantage. And sometimes, um, you know, I mean, I hope this is not being watched by anybody from any higher authorities because I don't want to do mea culpa <laughs> and, you know, being taken out. <laughs> Because I will deny it. Disney is, but let me, Disney is definitely our sponsor that's now left. They've oh, okay. us. But let me ask you, do you do you use your kids in, in these this vagueness, this ambiguousness of whether something's... I probably or? have. I cannot think of a direct example at the moment, but I probably have. I, I, I'm pretty sure that I might have uh, done the whole, you know, lying about their age when we we're getting on flights and stuff like that. And, you know, because, you know, you've seen my daughters they're They're uh, kind of on the smaller side you know, cause I'm not too tall. Um, although I feel like I'm six feet. Um, but you know, when, when they were not, uh, they were definitely over two and I'd say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're still okay to fly free. You know, they would just say they're under two and nobody really cared. And uh, there was one instance when somebody actually asked me, me for their, uh, um, immunization cards and I got like, well, I'm sorry, what, but yes, absolutely. Um, uh, and we you don't have a problem with it. I, I know it's wrong. I have, and I'm not ambiguous about it. I know exactly that it's wrong. <laughs> uh, do I have a problem with it? It depends. It depends. And you catch me on a different day. I might say yes. And some days I might say no. Well, so when we were talking about this uh, as maybe a topic, uh, it was brought up that maybe nobody has a problem with this. Maybe it's just we all do this. But the fact is, I, I think there are people out there, perhaps listening to this right now, that take issue with this. Absolutely. Oh, no, no. I don't think nobody has a problem with it. I think I may not have a problem with it. Uh, I uh, personally, and, you know, but I don't think that nobody has it. But I think Rizwan wants to maybe uh, say uh, something well, I very wanted to, deep. I wanted to share, I, I, you know what I do. I, I probably have the most problem with it, but I probably use it the most. Like I just did it at Korean barbecue the other day. I told Arik to say that he was eight years old, even though he's 10 so that we could pay half price. Cause I That's didn't think two years a full, because I didn't think he was going to eat a full humans uh, worth of food. And I didn't want to pay the full price. I also, the thing with Arik, my son, my son's name is Arik and he'll do it. My daughter, however, Ayana, we told her to do it at, uh, I don't even want to say it was at the dolphin habitat in Vegas. And we said, you need to say that you're five. And I think she was seven at the time because, it, and she said, I can't do that. I can't lie. I'm like, you, and me being the Indian dad that I am, I'm like, well, you know what? We're going in there. We haven't bought you a ticket. So either you say you're five or you can wait out here when we're done. We'll come back and get you. So I even went further. And then, of course, I felt guilty about it, like I always do. But I actually wanted to, we have, uh, Sanjay wasn't supposed to be part of this segment, but Sanjay's here. Sanjay, is your mute off? Because I wanted to ask you. Yeah, Sanjay, actually, I, actually I remember him telling me about the actual opposite part of this. So can you please share what happened to you? Yeah, I was, I was listening to your conversation. I'm raising my hand. I want to jump in on this right with you guys. So um, I had a two-year-old kid. Uh, he's three and a half now. And we went to this place in, in Pasadena, some children's museum kind of thing. And I'm standing at the counter with my kid there. He's a little taller than a two-year-old at that point. And and I'm buying the ticket. It says two-year-olds uh, um, are free to get in. And I pay, the I pay for my wife and me. And, and then we go. And this, the woman there behind the counter is like, you're basically, you're lying. And I'm like, I'm not lying. What do you want me to do? 
I said, and then I did a Karen thing. You know what I did? I said, I want to speak to the manager because she accused me of lying. <laughs> so, so, so the manager comes out and she says, no, I understand that. So then I, I went on Facebook and I showed him, showed her the exact time he was born. And, you know, I posted wow. Wow. and, and then she said to me, she said, she apologized. She said, I'm sorry, you know, but what, what happens here is people, all the time lie about this to get in for free. So I'm sorry, but that's why she behaved the way she did. So, so. because of Tony, Ismail, and Rizwan, <laughs> honest people like Sanjay and his family <laughs> have to get scrutinized. So yeah, we should feel guilty because we affected Sanjay because of <laughs> our lies and we didn't get called out, but Sanjay clearly did. Okay, Sanjay, we owe you one. No, no, you, no, you don't. You owe me one. But the thing was, it was it was weird because if I wasn't trying to hide anything, I had my son, Rian, right there with me. And she still thought I was lying. If I was trying you to get just it, I, have that look about you. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Ismail. It just looks deceptive. That's what we've learned. I can't lie. <laughs> Let me give you another scenario. Yes, I. So my wife and I were on a silly game show and we won some money for our kid. Uh, he was again, two and a half. And uh, part of the package was uh, a year's worth of diapers from, no, it, it wasn't from anywhere. It was a year's worth of diapers from a, a company. I, I, can I say the name of the company, the, the brand, or does it, does it matter? I mean, we've already doesn't been matter. canceled three times by Disney and other companies. So go ahead. <laughs> Right. So it was a year's worth of, I'll, I'll leave it out. So a year's worth of diapers. And basically what it was, was uh, 52 vouchers. Uh, basically it was vouchers for a pack of diapers up to $10 for the package. So I was looking at these and I'm like, okay, well, I can use one of these and different grocery stores have different prices, but for the most part, they're all under $10 for a, a package of diapers. And I was thinking to myself as we were preparing for our second kid, um, or maybe he was, no, he wasn't born yet. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I was thinking to myself, well, how can I, how can I stretch this further? Cause we're going to need diapers for, I don't know, maybe two years, two to three, possibly who knows. Uh, so what I did was I would take two of these vouchers, uh, and I, I went to the grocery store and said, Hey, can I, um, can I go ahead and use two of these for a bigger box? Cause you can get much more for, I don't know, for $20, you can get a, a nice big box uh, of diapers and lots of places were like, no, sorry, you can only use one at a time. So what I did is I drove around the city. I spent, oh my God, hours upon hours going to, I think I found a really good target. No, Kmart, a Kmart that's no longer open out here in Burbank, uh, where I could use two coupons at a time to get like a big package of diapers. And I would do a couple of them. I'd leave, I'd throw them in the car and come right back in and try a different uh, teller and a different uh, cashier and do the exact same thing. And I spent a lot of time being turned away, but I found a couple of places where I found the, uh, the right amount of places where I was able to uh, kind of work the system. I, this was already something I got for free and I was able to work the system and get probably about two and a half years worth of diapers. So again, I'm, it's for my kids. I guess I'm not using my kid in that scenario but i'm i'm now wrestling with that is that something that is that am i a shitty person and the answer is yes but for this in this instance was that a shitty thing to do i just want to acknowledge that i'm saying it officially that i'm sitting with a bunch of criminals <laughs> no, I was saying Tony has started a business i i'm i'm jealous that i haven't gotten all i this. i can see that all you're jealous is, we might need to have a whole segment on like how Tony gets all this stuff that you guys can also share. How to, how to beat, how to stick it to the man. I'm going to wrap up this segment and I want to uh, say thank you to Tony and Sanjay and Ismail. Uh, we might continue this ethically ambiguous as a regular segment. And, you know, it's just uh, fun to discuss things that are happening in our daily lives that we're sort of, uh, you know, questionable about. Uh, we have social media. We all have social media accounts that we'll share at some point. I'm uh, at Rizwan oh, Manji God. on, on no. Twitter. No, on Instagram at Riz underscore Manji on Instagram. And I have a Facebook page. So if you guys want to have ideas about ethically ambiguous topics that we can uh, share, we'll be uh, love to have your input. So thank you. I very can much. only imagine the hate. Only imagine the hate I'm going to get on social media if I share. I, it'll be me. I'll be the first one. Okay. Ruckus. Avenue Radio. Radio. 
Hi again, everybody. So we have uh, our segment called Ethically Ambiguous, and I have joining me Sanjay Chandani, who you guys know is an actor and a dad uh, and a bunch of other stuff. And he's going to share a story with us and we're going to chat about it. Hey, Sanjay. Hey, Riz. How are you? Good to be uh, here, man. Good, good, uh, good to have hey, you. Smile. Hey, Smile. What's up, man? Uh, so, um, you know, I was thinking we, we have this uh, ethical, ethically ambiguous uh, thing that we've been talking about. And uh, there's one of the things that make you go, hmm. I was thinking about, you know, when you're at a restaurant and uh, you order some food and the bill, uh, after you finish, you get the bill and uh, the waiter doesn't charge you for something. Do you mention some, um, do you call him back and mention something or do you live, leave a bigger tip for him? And if you leave a bigger tip for him, what happens? Uh, the restaurant loses money because they didn't charge you for an item. And so whether, you know, they may be a big restaurant, it doesn't matter, but where do you draw the line? And then, what do you, uh, what do you, what do, you do? Well, I guess my question is, what do you do? Do you have a general rule on what you do? What do I have a general rule? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do have a general rule about it. I always try and, um, call the waiter and say, you didn't charge me on it and I'd like to pay for it. And there's been times where he says, um, and you know what, don't worry about it. So then I have to let it go because he's like, he's not going to charge me. So I feel um, obligated to give him a bigger tip because he charged me less for, well, for the what money. about if it's a larger item? Like sometimes usually what they leave out is drinks, right? Like right. that happens a lot. But what if it's a large item, like they left out an entree or something? Are you still going to mention it or are you going to just uh, take the $15 that they, or can you even get an entree for $15 anymore? I have no idea. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that depends on the restaurant. Yeah, I don't think we can, but uh, you know what? I, I would tell them, I would call them and say, hey, listen, this is not on the, you know, you haven't charged me. You know, reverse that. I actually, uh, it was a more, speaking of a larger item, I was at the Trader Joe's and this new employee was, uh, you know, scanning the items and uh, it was something I bought some, something, I don't even remember what it, but it was about 10 or $12. And yeah. he was, he was just, he was just uh, going through and he had missed it and he had put it on the other side uh, without scanning it. And uh, I, I stopped him. I said, Hey, listen, you didn't scan this item. He says, yeah. no, no, I'm, sh I'm sure I did. I said, no, please check it. And, uh, he checked it and he hadn't scanned it and he rescanned it again. And he said he was so grateful that I was being so honest about it. And he wanted to, you know, he, he thanked me for it. So it, when you asked me the question about whether the price matters, it, it doesn't. It, I think it's the right thing to do. What, what about you, Ismail? I'm beginning to think this segment is called virtue signaling. <laughs> Oh, we well, wait, wait, because I have to believe if I'm going to guess, I'm like, Ismail's not going to say anything. You know what? If I have to be honest about it, it all depends on the situation. It is, it's not a hard and fast rule for me. It, it, it's all uh, from, you know, it depends on each specific circumstance and situation, because there's a lot of times when I go to a restaurant and I know like, like if you're, if you're regular somebody, I know like the, the, if the server knows us, there's a lot of time they comp our drinks and obviously we yeah. do, you know, uh, tip them a lot more. Um, uh, there have been times when, uh, you know, they have sort of left items and there has been maybe, I don't know, but those have been the lesser times that I've actually brought it up to their attention. It also depends on where I am. Now, I'm not trying to be virtue signaling here, but the fact is if it's a small mom and pop restaurant and, you know, it's um, not a big uh, swanky place where it's not going to hurt them at all. I'm like, you know what? Well, hey, it's my lucky day. But if it's, you know, if it's, if it's somewhere where I actually go and, you know, I, I probably, I'll probably bring it up. What do you I, think? So I, uh, I have really big guilt issues. You guys all know me. So you guys know, I have really, really big guilt issues. So I, I constantly will tell, I, I will say everything. So it's happened to me. It actually happened to me at a bank early on. Uh, when I was younger, I had a check and I would go to the bank to cash the check. And they gave me $60 more than, uh, than what I was supposed to get. And I told the teller and she was just so shocked. She's like, nobody would ever do that. And I'm like, I just, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I took that money. 
Uh, it's happened to it happens to me a lot in, in restaurants, and I and I always tell the one time that I felt differently about it, and I think I talked to Sanjay about this. Is um, I go to the casino, I play blackjack, I play you know just whatever <laughs> for fun, and I get uh, sometimes you don't win the hand, and the dealer ends up paying you despite the fact that you that you've lost the hand yeah. and i always was like oh you shouldn't uh, you 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 shouldn't have you shouldn't have paid me for this i lost and they're like oh or whatever and then one time one dealer said you know what you should don't, uh, please don't do that like in in separate because they essentially get in trouble afterwards and it really i, I don't know they 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 were like Yes, we make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. But when you do this, it, it becomes a thing. So I actually thought about it in a different in a different way. It also affects everyone else at the table, because if the dealer doesn't know that they that they that they weren't supposed to bust or whatever, and they think that they lost, it not only affects my money, but it affects everyone else at the table. So it's not just thinking about my personal money, but everyone else's. I still think it's wrong. I still think you should say it. But it made me think about it differently. Sanjay has a point there. Uh, yeah, I have a point here. I want to go back to uh, being uh, told it's virtue signaling. I don't see it as virtue signaling because I'm not trying to show it off to anybody. I'm just talking to the person and trying to, uh, trying to uh, do the right thing for myself, not for anybody else. And, I, and I, it comes across I'm a goody two-shoes. That's not the case. I, I just feel like in these cases, that's why I said I started the segment with things that go, hmm, what should we do? And I'm sure I've made mistakes before, but I don't think I was doing it to impress the other person. I if am a goody two shoes and everybody should know that because I <laughs> do. Tell. Yes, Ismail has his hand up. Go ahead. Ismael. Well, here's a question, uh, Rizwan. So you feel guilty about it in uh, these situations and you always want to do the right thing, but you don't feel guilty when you lie about your kid's age to get into the dolphin <laughs> habitat and other <laughs> stuff. Okay, okay. What happens to okay. the guilt then? This is this is the, the, okay. So if any if anyone's tuning in right now and didn't hear our other ethically ethically ambiguous, honestly, I don't know when these which order these things air on. But we 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 have an ethically ambiguous segment where we talk about telling our kids to lie about their age so they can yeah. get to different places. And I did admit that I lie about Korean barbecue because my son does not eat a full human meal. I I don't know why I don't feel guilty about that. That's right because. I really don't think that my little skinny Arik, who's 10 years old, eats $35 worth of meat. <laughs> well, that's called selective uh, you know, amnesia about yeah, your guilt. Like we are all selective. Uh, Fine. Thank you for making me feel guilty. Now I'm going to go and cry. No, but no, Ismail makes me feel guilty too. I'm sure I've done selective, uh, selective things. I, You're I, just a virtue signaler. Let's just <laughs> agree okay. to disagree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gee, uh, thanks. I have just been called a hypocrite on the show, so thank you very much. I, I, and I, it's so just, a, it's just great to have doctor. friends like this. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? Thank you so much. I think this thank was, you. Uh, uh, you know, again, this uh, segment, ethically ambiguous talks. Uh, we like to talk about things that we're sort of feeling weird about in the world, and whether or not we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And uh, we'd like to hear from you guys as well. So if you have any topics that uh, that you'd like for us to think about, let us uh, share. We'll share our social media at some point and we'll let you guys know. But um, thank you. Thank you for listening to us. Thanks, Sanjay. Thanks. Thank Ismail. you. Thanks, Actually, Ismail. Not, no thanks, Ismail. But yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. No, always. It's always your pleasure. No one else's. Uh, I'm, <laughs> All right. I'm... <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Brighter Side of News. I, again, am Rizwan Manji. Thank you to Tony Manhala, Isma Bashi, Joseph Shavit, and Sanjay Chandani for joining me today. And if you liked what you heard, then please tune in again. You're listening to the Ruckus Avenue Medical Minute. Most fevers in children can be managed conservatively at home with measures that include the use of acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Hi, I'm Dr. Amita Mundanchira. Seek immediate medical attention if your child has a fever and any of the following. Age is less than three months old. Recent travel abroad. Problems breathing. Stiff neck. Inability to use arms or legs normally. Inability to keep down any fluids, not peeing and appears dehydrated. Lethargy or confusion. 
first time seizure or long seizure associated with fever, constant crying that is hard to settle. When in doubt, always consult your doctor. You have been listening to the Ruckus Avenue Medical Minute. Follow us on social media at Ruckus Avenue Radio and use the hashtag Ruckus Avenue Radio.